this time, we ask that you stand and rise into the family and proceed into the chapel. This uh, occasion of uh, celebrating the life of Jim Whitehead. We appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Bishop Gentry. Uh, I'll be conducting this meeting. Up here with me is a uh, good friend, presiding brother, uh, President Mensa. We'll begin and this meeting by thanking those who are participating. There's uh, been great hand, helping hands, uh, those who are participating with the luncheon and funeral services, and uh, we just appreciate the support has been given. We'd like to thank uh, Sister Belinda Olson for being our organist and then uh, also conducting the music will be Sister Christy Costello. We'll begin by singing hymn 249, Call to Serve. Our opening prayer will then be given by Ruth Whitehead, who's a daughter-in-law.
Virgin Father in Heaven, we're grateful for this opportunity to be here this day to celebrate Jim Whitehead. We all know him and love him and will miss him. We're grateful that we have the opportunity to be with him in this world and that we know that he's healthy and happy and safe and with many more loved ones on the other side than are here. We're grateful for him and we know that he has sisters here that love him and children that love him and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and relatives and friends that will all miss him. Please be with them and comfort them at this time. Hold them up in thy arms. And we ask you to please watch a special, watch over a very special blessing to Diane, who has given him such tender loving care and been such a sweet companion to Grandpa. Bless her, her routine is going to change and it's going to be hard. But we're grateful for the privilege that we know that Grandpa will be with her for a while. He will help her, he will sustain her, and he will bless her family that have been so good to serve their mom at this time. We ask a special blessing to be with all those who are in need of thy comfort and thy care and thy arms around them in whatever ways they are in need at this time. Again, we thank thee for thee and for thy son, and we ask that thy spirit will be with us, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The program will be as follows. We will have a life sketch given by Sister Diane Knight. The speaker following um, Sister Knight will be uh, Scott Casteller. We'll then have some uh, videos of some memories that are shared by some grandchildren, which will play on the projector up here. Following those memories that are shared, we will have a musical number sung, How Great Thou Art, accompanied by or with the violins by Ariane Chipping and Haley Heyman, and with the accompanist of Diana Ramstack. After the musical number, we'll have a speaker, Randy Whitehead, who is the son of Jim, and we'll also have a speaker, uh, the concluding speaker, Jim Whitehead, who is also the son of Jim. My kind, sweet, wise, brave, patient, gracious, champion of the man, and giant of the father, James Blake Whitehead, was born in Culver City, California on March 13, 1931, at 13 minutes past 3 in the afternoon. He had the most epic birthday ever, 31331. His proud, adoring parents, Lily Cameron and James Willis Whitehead, were so excited to welcome their first child. He had three younger sisters, Margie, Joni, and Christy, who all say that he was the best brother a girl could ever have. His was an idyllic childhood. He grew up in Los Angeles, California, back in the days when it wasn't crowded and the neighborhoods were surrounded by bean fields. He made lifelong friends as a young boy. When Dad was five or six years old, his father made him a racer and pulled Jim in it behind the family's Model T. His father also took him to watch midget auto races. This whetted Dad's appetite for racing. His father was heavily involved in boy scouting, serving as a scout commissioner. And as a young boy, Dad went to many scouting activities. When he was about 12 or 13 years old, Dad had a defining moment, which he could recall as plain as day, all of his life. He said he was standing in the middle driveway of his house and had a very clear impression, maybe even heard a voice. Jim, you need to make something of yourself. He determined then and there to do just that and make his parents proud. When he was 14 years old, his dad asked him to go to the Boy Scout camp on Catalina Island for the summer and be in charge of taking ice and food to the camp by boat each day. 
The blocks of ice weighed 100 pounds, and he had to drive the boat 10 or 12 miles each way from the isthmus to the camp. But he stayed all summer and enjoyed the experience. His father got him a motor scooter for his efforts. The next year, his father asked him to, to go to Camp Emerald Bay again. This time, he said that he would get Jim a 37 Chevy Coupe if he would go, and Dad agreed. There was a big responsibility at such a young age, but he was determined to make something of himself. The 37 Chevy wasn't running when he got it, but he figured out what was wrong and got it all fixed up and souped up. He loved to work on cars for the rest of his life. Dad was a hard worker. He had a paper route when he was 12 or 13 and then again when he was 18 years old. This time he delivered 400 papers each day in an old Model A, which he painted white. We're so excited for the Model A that brought him here today. He removed all the passenger seats in order to have room for the newspapers and was pretty darn good at throwing the papers so they landed in just the right spot. His father was a general contractor, and he took Jim to work with him from the time he was a young boy. Dad worked for his father until he was 24 years old. He often ran the backhoe, but also maintained all the equipment. The Korean War started in 1950. Dad and a couple of his buddies went to Santa Monica to see an army tank that was on display. A recruiter talked to them, and they later returned with more friends. All 13 buddies signed up for the Army Reserves that day, and just in time, because the next day, they received their draft notices in the mail. They all went to basic training together, and for the next seven years, had meetings every Wednesday evening, spent one week in a month in training, and two weeks at summer camp. The buddies kept in touch all of these years, and Dad was the last to survive. Mom was friends with Dad's sisters, Marky and Joni. Dad took Mom out on a date one, one time, but he thought she was a bit giggly, so he didn't ask her out again for another year. On June 24, 1952, they were married in the Mesa, Arizona Temple. The Los Angeles Temple, which my dad helped build, was not completed at the time. They had four children, Jim Jr., Randy, Diane, and Lynn. In the mid-50s, Dad began racing go-karts for fun, and he was good at it. He was invited to race for a company sponsor and continued racing for almost 20 years. He raced sprint tracks at first, but then progressed to enduro carts on road races, road courses. But his favorite races of all were the Saturday night races on dirt tracks. He even raced a 500 miler with his buddy Mick Rupp on the famous Willow Springs track in the Mojave Desert. They won. Over his career, Dad won more than 600 trophies and was Grand National Champion numerous times. He was featured in the Carding World magazine where they described him in this way, and I think it describes him to a T. Family man, carding champion, and mechanical genius, that's Jim Whitehead of Los Angeles, California. Whitehead's quiet confidence, modest manner, and technical know-how is his trademark. He is known in karting circles as a big time winner, a champion's champion. He also appeared on TV on the wide world of sports. It was always fun to go to the races. Everyone loved and respected my dad, and it seemed to me that he always won. Mick Rupp, one of his racing buddies, tried repeatedly to get dad to move to Ohio and work for him at his plant, where he manufactured go-karts, mini bikes, and snowmobiles. Finally, in 1968, Dad accepted the offer. Mansfield, Ohio was a big change from the bustling city of Los Angeles, but we all fell in love with that. Dad's first project there was building a snowmobile dragster. He was later in charge of research and development for the entire company and was the head of prototype. We children had our own fleet of fun toys at home. We rode mini bikes all over the countryside in the summer and snowmobiles in the winter. My brother may or may not have clocked me going 90 miles an hour on one of our snowmobiles. <laughs> After the company was sold, Dad moved us to Salt Lake City where much of his family lived. That was the end of his racing career. He once told Alan that it wasn't fun to race anymore because he always won. <laughs> he began working for Chevrolet dealerships, first as shop foreman and then as service manager. 
His service departments were the best of the best, and Dad won many awards and trips from Chevrolet for his efforts. He and Mom were able to travel to England, Italy, Hong Kong, China, and to Paris on some of those trips. After working for Chevrolet, he decided to build a custom home in Sandy. He and Mom designed every detail of the home, and Dad built it with help from the boys. After finishing the house, Dad ran his own dump truck and backhoe business for the next 16 years. Lynn was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1997. She and Dad were special friends who hung out together while Scott was on his mission. Dad loved to go Christmas shopping each year with Lynn and me to pick out presents for Mom, but Lynn and her family lived in Louisville, Kentucky. So in 1998, after Lynn had completed her first courses of chemo and radiation, we sisters plotted and schemed to get her here for the big shopping day. Dad was so surprised and excited to see her that he cried. Lynn passed away in the year 2000, leaving a big hole in our hearts. But we know she's been with us all these 21 years, and she's here today. In September 2001, Dad got a call from the state president asking if he and Mom could come to his office. Dad thought Mom was getting a new church calling that had happened before. When they got there, the state president asked Mom and Dad if they would serve a mission to Adam and Diana. They were totally taken by surprise. The state president told them to go home and think about it. I remember that day well. It was our monthly family dinner at my parents' house, and Dad greeted me as I came in the door with my family. He put his arm around me and said, Dizzy, I got called on a mission today. Now, even though my parents were married in the temple, my dad was inactive, or less active, for over 50 years. My mother faithfully took us children to church by herself for all of those years, and nightly we prayed for dad to have the desire to come back to church. When dad told me about the mission call, I thought he was teasing, and I opened my mouth to reply. But something stopped me, and I said, you would be a wonderful missionary. It took until December for Dad to make a decision. We were all waiting and praying and hoping, but not wanting to pressure him. In early December, Dad and I were Christmas shopping without Shorty. We always bought about 20 pairs of new socks as one of Mom's gifts because she was famous for having holes in her socks. We were in the sock shop at University Mall, and I asked if they had some kind of discount for large purchases. The clerk said they only had missionary discounts. My dad piped up and said, well, I'm going on a mission. It was the first any of us had heard of his decision. We bought the socks and got the missionary discount. <laughs> and I couldn't stop smiling for days. The mission to Adam and Diane was a highlight of Dad and Mom's life together. Before they left, Dad and Mom celebrated their 50th anniversary. The entire family went to Hawaii, where Dad returned to the temple for the first time. He chose to do baptisms for the dead so all the grandkids could participate. It was a glorious trip. Dad also finished restoring his beautiful navy blue 47 Ford pickup before he left for Adam on Diamon. It took about a year. He will take his last ride in it today on the way to the cemetery. In March of 2003, Jimmy, Randy, and I drove our parents to Admon de Almen. It was, a, it was bittersweet leaving them behind, but they had much work to do. The women did family history for several hours a day, and the men took care of the vast property. Dad kept all of the heavy equipment in good repair, and helped with many other projects, such as maintaining the roads with a road grader, whitewashing fence posts along the seven miles of internal roads on the property, trimming trees, mowing miles of lawn and keeping all the buildings in good repair. Dad even helped construct a beautiful new computer room for the women to work in. After their mission time was through, Dad said that serving a mission was the best thing that had ever happened to him. He would have been happy to stay for two more years. After they returned home, Polly and Jim decided to downsize. They searched both Salt Lake and Utah counties and finally found the perfect setup in Lehigh where they built their house with a workshop and back. Dad has spent countless hours in the workshop helping others realize their dreams. He helped Randy restore another 47 Ford pickup, this one is black, built a Cobra from scratch, built playhouses, helped with Pinewood Derbies, 
and worked on Uncle Charles's Model A collection. He even sat out in his wheelchair and watched Jimmy and Randy make his casket. It was a sweet experience for him. In 2009, my mom had a double knee replacement and suffered a watershed stroke during the operation. We were told she would never return home or walk again. After 89 days in the hospital, she walked out with Dad at her side. Dad spent most of his time for the next year and a half being the primary caregiver for Mom as she learned to talk and walk and be independent again. In 2015, Alan and I bought the house next door. It is nothing short of miraculous how everything fell into place in less than two weeks. In the intervening six years, we have seen the hand of the Lord in that move. Mom passed away in October 2019, and Dad's health declined rapidly. In closing, I'd like to share some of the lessons that he taught me. I have learned such amazing things from my dad. As his health declined, I watched in amazement as he accepted his limitations. Instead of mourning all the adventuresome things that he used to do, he was content, very content with his situation. He accepted help graciously, always thanking the person who came to help and remembering them in his prayers. Which were, which were heartfelt and humble. I learned from him that prayers don't need to last a long time or be elaborate or drawn out. Heavenly Father hears us. He often said, keep smiling, and he lived by that admonition. I was a pretty moody teenager, and one morning at the breakfast table, Dad pounded on the counter and said, today we're going to be happy. I realized that it was my choice, and after that I tried to become a more cheerful person. My dad was honest to the core. If he owed someone money, he paid them promptly. One time as a little girl, I was at the store with him, and the clerk gave him too much change. He noticed and gave it right back. That gave, made a big impression on me. One time when he was racing, the guy in front of him blew an engine on the very last lap. Dad drove his cart right up behind that guy, put his feet on that guy's cart, and pushed him over the finish line. The other guy came in first, and my dad came in second. When I remarked how amazing that, that was, he matter-of-factly said, I hadn't been able to catch him the whole race, and he deserved to win. Each day, I walked the short path from my door to his numerous times. Last night, about midnight, I decided I wanted to see how many steps it was. It's exactly 50, stepping off my doorstep and stepping onto his. I always looked forward to his cheerful greeting. Often he was asleep in his chair, so I would kneel right next to him. He'd open his beautiful blue eyes and say, It's my favorite doozy. How was your day? What an honor it has been to be his daughter. For the rest of eternity, I will treasure this time that we've had to be together. From him, I learned that I am enough. I imagine that is how I will feel in my Heavenly Father's presence. I want to end with a poem by Perry Tanksley that Lynn cross-stitch for my dad many years ago. Who always liked me from the start, and trusted me with all his heart, who inspired me to live with courage and cheered me when I felt discouraged, whose special love sets me apart. I love you, Dad, with all my heart. I must have whispered that in his ear a million, and a million times. Here's a million and one. I love you, Dad, with all my heart. I would like to express heartfelt thanks to everyone who helped care for my dad so tenderly over the past few years. Our childhood friend from Ohio, Gretchen Keck McCullough, was a true friend and an untiring caregiver who always knew just what to do. And then her boss, Christina, has taken over. My dad loved to look at Christina's shoes and he always commented, nice shoes, Christina. 
The dear people from Elevation Hospice will be eternal friends. Aileen was nothing short of an angel. And my dad looked forward to her amazing help every day. She came to our house for over three years, first helping Grammy, my mom, and then helping my dad. Her care the morning of my dad's passing on Wednesday is the ultimate act of love. Jan, our nurse, walked us through this adventure with grace and love. Dad adored her, and she is like a sister to me. We would have been lost without all of these people. Thank you to everyone for the countless acts of love and kindness from so many of you. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Diane. I'm honored to be here, but I think you're going to be understand where you read I'd rather not be here. I cry anywhere that this is going to be bad. Um, Jim was adored by the end. To the point that initially I was quite jealous. But I soon realized she adored me too, so it was okay. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not quite sure why, but I know why she adored Jim. She loved being with him. Um, it would be very hard to explain how much she loved being with him. When we were dating, I loved to be with Lynn. I mean, if I wanted to be with her on Thursday night, I had to sit down with Jim and her and watch Not Slanty. <laughs> I did not like that show. <laughs> but I, I learned all the characters and actually probably got a little more interested than I would have guessed. Um, but that's how it was. She liked doing things with her dad, and there were many times, especially when we were dating, and even when we were first married and lived here, that I got to do with things with, with dad. And, and I learned to appreciate what a great man he was. It's a funny story. She believed he could fix anything. And he could. And she and I were first married on Chevettes. Each of us had a, she had a green Chevette and I had a yellow Chevette. And to call them entry level vehicles is probably being generous. Um, <laughs> and she expected her Chevette to be perfect. Because dad could fix everything. And it started squeaking one time. And this is the only time that I remember Lynn being upset at her dad. It had a squeak, and so we went over. I believe I was sitting in the back seat of the Chevette, which was not comfortable. And we went for a drive to show Dad the squeak. And he heard the squeak, we heard the squeak, and we came back, and she said, Well, Dad, what do we need to do? And he says, You need to turn up the radio. <laughs> he, and that's what he said, and that's, he didn't do anything about it. And I remember going home, she was mad. <laughs> she didn't want to squeak in her car. She had a squeak in her car, so we got rid of it. And I thought that was the perfect answer. He knew it probably wasn't fixable. You know, Dad taught me so much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my relationship with him. Um, I had the opportunity to help a lot of time on the Danish house, or the Danish Road house. Spent a lot of time with him. And the skills I learned have served me so much. And it was a joy to help him. I learned so many skills. And I passed some of those on, but not near enough to my kids. And he was so calm. I made a big mistake one time when they were pouring spit. He put me in charge. You guys probably know the retaining wall that was bowed. That was my fault. Um, I didn't stop the um, cement guy in time, and I knew and didn't do it. And he noticed immediately because cement work was their thing. And he 
wasn't upset at all. It didn't bother him at all, and it bothered me every time I went to that house. <laughs> he was so calm. One time we went for our third trip for two by fours. We could not count how many two by fours we needed. We kept having to go back, and we had probably 100, 150 two by fours in the back of his truck. We were going up Creek Road, and the funny thing is, this morning I was sitting at Ariane's and Neil's house. And I looked over and I could see that hill, that hill. That sounded like a southern accent. <laughs> I did live in Indiana for 26 years, right on the border of Kentucky. Um, on that hill, as we were going up, all those two my horse went out of the back of the truck. <laughs> on the road. I'd have been mad. He was calm as could be. We just got out and reloaded them and they fell out again. And <laughs> Pretty hard to load around the hill. But we got him back. But it just his demeanor was so calm and such an example to me. He could correct you without offending you. He expected good behavior, he let you know it, and he could do that. Another wonderful thing that I will never be able to thank the whole Whitehead family about, and especially Jim. Is what I reburied. They were just, just so disgusting. <laughs> of course, they. Me. Beyond I could ever hope for. Welcomed her into the family as a daughter. Never treated her differently. He greeted her much more joyfully than he did me whenever we came home. <laughs> that was so wonderful. He loved her. I knew it. She knew it. You know, we lived before we came here to Earth. When we came, we had that memory taken away. We were here to be tested. When we die, we don't stop. I'm so grateful that he is now with those that he loved including his wife and daughter. And through the atonement of Christ, we will be resurrected and be able to live together again. This I believe, and this I know Jim believed. And I say this because in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My memories of Grandpa are very special to me, and I am grateful to be able to share them. Of course, all the Christmas memories and family parties at the Danish Road House will always hold a very special place in my heart. Um, also, his Smarty Dispenser. That's a huge childhood memory of mine. Um, as I've gotten older, his kindness and his love towards Parker and his various projects and time and efforts that he has spent with Parker that Parker will always cherish for the rest of his life, I know. Um, also doing the big playhouse Santa surprise for my children that we will always hold dear to our hearts. And lastly, him always calling me Leashy Babe and always having a smile and knowing that he loved me and supported me and how much I love and cherish him in so many ways. I love you, Grandpa. Thinking of my grandpa always makes me smile. He loved his family so much. I'll miss his side hugs and him asking how my curtain climbers are doing. He's always had a way of making us feel loved, whether it was giving us pennies to get Smarties out of the candy machine or showing up at every single event of my childhood. I knew I could count on Grandpa. One special memory I have of him was when I was lucky enough to visit him and Adam on Diamond. I remember how proud he was to show us around, telling us about all the work he was doing. But the funny part is that what he was most excited to show us were the raccoons he was feeding. They'd come right up to the back door for food. I've always loved hearing stories from his life, though I've heard most of them from others since Grandpa wasn't really one to brag. He will always be an inspiration to me and an example of humility, integrity, and hard work. 
I don't know if you realized it or not, but he was pretty special. I'll miss you, Gramps. It's hard to sum up such an amazing man in just a short minute. But I think one of the most amazing things about Grandpa is that he could make you feel like you were the most special and most loved and most important person in the world when he was with you. Um, I'll be forever grateful for the advice he gave me, for the love he gave me, um, and for helping me to feel like I was important and special to him. Um, it was amazing that when I would see him, when he was having a bad day, it was because someone else was having a bad day that week. It was because he was worried about someone who had been diagnosed with cancer or who had lost their job or who had been sick and admitted to the hospital. And he felt so deeply for everyone in his life. Um, he was also pretty cool, but I'll be forever grateful that I had a cheerleader for my grandpa. I have been blessed to spend countless hours with my grandfather in his workshop working on cars. I have learned so much, like many others, from working with him. He was always so patient with me and willing to deal with my mistakes and my countless questions. On many occasions, we would need to fabricate something specific for the project we were working on. I was always so impressed by Grandpa. He didn't go to a fancy college. He didn't have a big formal education, but he knew how to learn, and he wasn't afraid to try. More importantly, he wasn't afraid to fail. He knew that with enough perseverance, asking questions, and just hard work, that he could figure anything out. And it's really taught me the same thing. I know from him how to learn and that failing is okay if you're willing to pick yourself up again and keep trying. I love my grandpa and I'm gonna miss him, but the lessons he's taught me are going to stay with me for the rest of my life. Gramps is a good example to me of someone who did the right thing because it was the right thing, not because it was what someone else wanted him to do or what someone else thought he should do. Um, he just did it because he knew it was the right thing. Um, sometimes that even came at a great personal cost to him, um, but he did it anyway. And I love him for that example. Um, I also love him for just the regular everyday memories I have. Uh, jelly beans as a kid, soda. <laughs> he used to tease me about the color purple being purple uh, to make me laugh. Um, I just loved his easy, um, accepting way of everyone and um, what a good example he was to all of us to do that. Love you, Gramps. I have two memories I'd like to share. The first is from when I was a little kid. This is my first memory um, of Gramps and he was building his house on Danish Road and Grammy took us to take him lunch and we had a giant bag of Dum Dum Suckers and he was so excited to see us and we sat and ate lunch and ate our suckers and that's something that Gramps always did was he was always happy to see us no matter what. Um, the second memory is from a few years ago, I had built some bookshelves in my family room and um, when I finished, someone commented and said, wow, it takes some awesome tools to build something like that. And I was really sad about that because I had worked hard and it's not just tools that build something. And, he laughed and said, you know, I've seen a lot of really crummy things built with some really nice tools. You did a great job, Nikki. So he just knew how to make you feel good. When I was 10 or 11, my mom and I went to Salt Lake City and on the way home, we took Wasatch Boulevard to get back to Grandma's house on Danish Road. 
um, as we were going up the hill, our car wouldn't accelerate out of first gear. So we pulled off to the side. We weren't really sure what to do. My mom looked in the rearview mirror and there was a dump truck coming up the side. And she was like, oh my gosh, there's a dump truck. I hope that I'm like off to the side enough. I don't know what to do. And that dump truck came and pulled right up behind us. And it was Gramps. And he told us, you know, what was wrong with the car, what we could do, that he would take care of us. And uh, we got back to his house. And I think that that was just a good metaphor for Gramps um, in our whole lives as if you have a problem, somehow he's always right there behind you to support you, to answer your questions and to make sure that you know that you can be taken care of. Um, I'm so grateful for his example and for him being so particular and making us feel special for who we are. Love you, Gramps. I remember in junior high, I had the opportunity to make a go-kart in one of my technology classes. And I asked my mom if I could do it and she said that I could. And the first thing that she said was, you should have Gramps help because he was the best go-karter in the world. And I remember him coming down to my junior high and helping me learn how to weld and helping me learn how engines work and helping me learn how to cut metal. And I've always remembered those skills and used them almost daily in my life still to this day. I always love you and I'm always going to miss you, Gramps. You taught me things that I'm going to keep with me for the rest of my life. I've been thinking about all the great memories we have of Gramps and one of the things that sticks out to me is how happy he always is. He was always a good sport and was always willing to go along with whatever activity Grammy had planned for the day. And I'm just grateful for his example of hard work and being happy and making the best of every situation. We love you, Gramps. Gramps was the best. This is how I'll remember him. Rides in his dump truck as a kid. The smell of cut wood in his workshop. Riding in the red Jeep in his backyard and climbing across that rock wall. Squeezing my shoulders whenever he gave me a hug. Harping on Grammy whenever she took too long to take a picture. <laughs> Calling her Polycat calling me sweetie pie or hun, and calling my mom shorty, letting me take jelly beans from his candy jar, next to his chair, always in front of the TV, wearing a Mickey watch that always had little bits of rock stuck in the glass, always working so hard and being such a great resource whenever you had a car issue or something that needed to be fixed around the house. He was always willing to drop whatever he was doing to come over to help, and he always knew how to fix it. He always made me feel so special. He was always so supportive and always showed up whenever I had a performance. I'm so grateful for Grammy for putting up with him all those years. Our lives would have never been the same had he not been in them. We are so lucky and so blessed. Love you, Gramps. Uh, some of my favorite things about Grandpa was uh, just remembering the smell in his workshop at his house in Sandy. Uh, anytime I'm in a garage or I smell oil or gas or any woodworking shop I always think of of grandpa um, as a kid I always remembered uh, stealing some of his jelly beans next to his chair um, and getting some some wild cherry Pepsi soda when we'd come out to visit him for the summers um, uh, one of the things I respected about him the most is um, how well he treated everybody um, when they came into the room, he always made them feel like they were the most important person. And he always came up and said hi to them. Um, and how well he treated my mom. I uh, love you, Grandpa. Sure gonna miss you. And thank, thank you for all the wonderful memories and important life lessons that you've taught us. Uh, one of my favorite things about Gramps was um, his jelly bean jar. He always had one next to his chair growing up and I always loved every time we'd go visit Utah in July to go and take some of his jelly beans out of his jar and I loved that they um, occasionally would have a different lid on it and I loved switching and looking at all the different lids on the jelly beans and one of the last times I actually got to see Gramps um, he was able to sh share some jelly beans with my kids and so that was a really fun moment to have um, for them a special memory that I have with Gramps. Probably my favorite memory of Grandpa Whitehead is when I was young I don't remember exactly when I 
I um, was shown the garage in the back with all of his cars and he showed me all of them and I thought they were so cool. Kind of sparked my fascination for cars and just kind of just retro older things and ever since then when I was young I'd always be wanting to see it every time I came and visited and I love those things. I, I think one time I even got to ride in it like just out on the street. Um, <laughs> that was probably yeah my favorite memory of grandpa.
Scott, for the record, I was jealous of you when you spent all that time with Dad. <laughs> um, to straighten out the record, yes, Diane may have been clock going 90 miles an hour on that snowmobile. And yes, she and I made a little makeshift um, motorcycle track in a field by our house. And if she had the faster motor, or the fastest mini bike, there was no way I could catch her. <laughs> um, I wanted to share some thoughts and experiences that I had with Dad and what he taught me. Um, I idolized my dad. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be with him. And uh, when he was racing go-karts, which is all I remember when I was a little boy, is I wanted to go with him when he would go to Horseman's Place. That was one of his sponsors and work on his go-karts. And when he went and I didn't go, I felt loved. I felt scared. And if he didn't come home when I thought he should, because I always stayed awake waiting for him to come home. I remember pleading with God. I think this is where I learned how to pray. Heavenly Father, help Dad get home safely. I love that man. Um, I watched Dad change over time. I watched him grow into an incredible man. I never cared that he wasn't perfect because he was Dad. And everything he did in my eyes was good and was right. He taught me a lot of things. One of them was, he'd say, Randy, if I was trying to do something that wasn't quite the right way, he would say, Randy, if you don't have the time to do it right the first time, when are you going to find the time to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> I bought, I told him when I was 16 that I was going to buy a car, and I wanted to buy a Sunbeam Alpine. It was a little English red sports car convertible and they were known for having lots and lots of problems he said randy i don't know if i'd buy that if i were you you're going to be working on it all the time but i thought it was a cool car so i bought it and he was right when i had to take the motor apart instead of saying i told you so randy he uh, told me what to do, and I fixed one part, and he told me, Randy, you also ought to replace these parts while you have the engine out and you're doing all of that work. But then that costs more money. He said, just do it. Do it right the first time, because you know how much time it took you to take it all apart, and certainly you will do it again. And I, I loved him for that. He taught us to respect things. He taught us that if we drove our motor, motorcycle, mini bike, snowmobile, whatever it was, that it had better be clean when we're done with it. And there was nothing that could make him more angry with us quicker than to not take care of our stuff. And um, I can remember time after time again when I didn't follow that. And that was the time he'd be mad at me. He always shared his opinion in a kind and unassuming way. After a while, you'd get to understand his ways, right? And If you were doing something wrong or a way that wasn't going to work, 
he wouldn't tell you you're doing it wrong. He'd say something like, pal, I wouldn't do it that way if I were you. He wouldn't tell you what to do. He would wait for you to ask him why, or why isn't that right, or what would you do? So here's an incredible lesson I learned from him, and a lot of lessons I learned kind of make me look stupid, but it's okay. So as Diane said, he had built his blue 47 Ford pickup. And we wanted to build one for RJ because at the time he was going to turn 16 years old. So we built one, but we ended up getting the motor and the transmission and the rear end out of a Mustang. And when we took the parts out of the Mustang, there was this little switch called a rollover switch that essentially if the car rolled over, it would turn off the fuel pump so that the fuel pump wouldn't keep going and the car would burn down and we debated whether we should put it in. We decided to put it in because it was the right thing to do. And um, I was driving the truck after we were done one time and I drove into my driveway and the truck stopped working. And I said, I, and I worked for a couple hours trying to figure out why it wouldn't work. I couldn't figure it out. So I called Dad. I said, Dad, here's what's happening. What do you think was wrong? He said, well, I think it's that rollover switch, Randy. And we had mounted it right between the two front, the two seats. Right in between. So when you sat down, it was right there at your fingertips. And all you had to do was push it to reset it to see if it would work. He said, try that rollover switch. I said, Dad, I don't think that's it. So I spent another few hours that week checking everything else out. And he called up a week later, Randy, did you get that truck to run? No. He said, did you try that rollover switch? No, Dad, I don't think that's it. The next week, Randy, did you get the truck running? No, and I told him all the things that I had done that week that didn't work. Did you try that rollover switch? No, Dad. Another week went by, so it was a whole month this truck wouldn't run. And he stopped at the house. Randy, did you get the truck to run? No, Dad. Randy, let's try that rollover switch. So I sat in that same seat. I turned that same key that I had tried a thousand times to see if I could get it to run. But first, I pushed that little button, and that's all I had to do. And it worked. <laughs> and to me, that lesson became a lesson in faith. It has kind of changed my life in a lot of ways and as I look at God. If we don't believe, we don't try. In my case, the only thing I had to do was push that switch. It didn't take one second of my time. But since I didn't believe, I didn't try. And I've watched my dad over the years change. He didn't go to church. He had never said a prayer. In my mind, God or things of that nature as a kid to him seemed unimportant. But I watched him change his life and try things that he had never tried. He pushed the switch, so to speak, and was able to experience things that he never would have been able to experience. And I marvel 
that a man who was 70 some years old, when he let the Spirit catch his life, so to speak, was able and willing to change his life. And that will forever be an incredible example to me. Another incredible experience was when Diane said that, you know, he was asked to go serve this mission in Adam on Diane. I called up the people at the church and I said, can you really ask someone to go on a mission that hasn't gone to church in 50 years? What were you thinking? And the guy kind of chastised me, really. But Dad didn't say no, as Diane said. And so we thought, well, what could we do to help him make up his mind? So we decided we'd ask him if he'd like to take a trip back to Missouri. And he had a friend that was working on one of the temples in Nauvoo, Dion Graybill. We said you could see Dion. And then we made arrangements to go to Adamondion, where He's been called to serve, or at least extended the call to. And so he could look at it. So they knew we were coming, and to my brothers and sisters, in my perspective, the guy that was there running it offended him. At least he offended us because the guy said to Dad, I know why you are here. And you shouldn't have to come here to check it out to see if you want to make up your mind. And to us, that was incredibly offensive. And if I was my dad, I would have just told the guy to stick it in his ear and left. Been upset with that guy. And my dad didn't let that offend him. He didn't let something like that bother him. It bothered Jim and Diane and I. We were afraid to even ask him for a week after that what he thought of it. We thought we'd totally blown any chance in the world that he would ever decide to go. And that has taught me to not let other people's comments or the way they treat us, we shouldn't let them offend us. Because usually when we let somebody offend us, we're the ones that take the burden. We're the ones that carry that grudge. We're the ones that feel angry. And he let that slide off of him like nothing. And I had never seen it anybody do something like that in my life. I had sent out some texts to some of his, his buddies um, that didn't let him know that dad had passed away. And one of them, his name was Butch Stewart, was a guy that worked for Dad when he worked for Rob in Ohio, and he used to race go-karts. And here's what he said, and this kind of sums up my feelings of Dad. He said, Jim was my hero and my mentor. He always gave me the right advice. I am proud be Jim's son. I am honored to be his son. I am grateful for the lessons that he has taught me in life. And I want to be like him. When I think of God, I don't think of somebody who's mean, who's mad at us, that wants to punish us for doing the wrong things. 
I think of somebody who loves us like God. I think of somebody who wants to help us to become all that we can become. I'm grateful to have the death that reminds me of God. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> We have been truly blessed. I hope to be able to share some fun perspectives on Dad and some learning things that has influenced every one of us in our lives. This past year has moved Diane, Randy, and me, along with Lynn, who inspired us to appreciate what our mom and dad has done for us our entire lives. Randy and I exchanged such moments as we drove down each Saturday to work on his casket and get Dad his Five Guys burger. But Dad only wanted a half a burger, so we just started getting him two and a half guys burgers. That blessing is that our family, despite, believe me, all its wide perspective opinions and viewpoints, has stayed together and found ways to appreciate each other when times get tough. And our family has had those times. This is in a world today of drama, digital dissonance, and dysfunctional distractions that families don't even know each other. We have something solid connected to how dad and mom taught us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a sure foundation upon which we have many awesome stories to reflect. We've worked hard at this over the years, and what sweet fruit that effort has borne. Thanks for being our parents, and today, for being our dad. Growing up in L.A. after church, we often got to visit him, but at the racetrack, at Agora, at Willow Springs or Riverside. Being in the pits brought a lot of adrenaline. And my dad repeatedly won more than his share, and as a national champion. Mom was wise to make us go to church first, but she let us have those enduring moments with dad. As the oldest and first experiment with parenting, I apparently lived up to the challenge I was for them. Uh, beginning the time, the midget race car came back to the pits, and as a two-year-old, I just barged over and put my hands on the hot sizzling headers. Dad reactively, reactively seized my arms, plunged my hands into a five-gallon bucket of grease, and I have no scar scars and apparently recovered amazingly. Mom and Dad took us up to Zuma Beach and to Palmdale, often as kids, that we knew well all of our grandparents. These wonderful memories make up my life, and it means a lot to me to have spent so much time with Grandpa's Grandma's Whitehead and Reese. I am grateful Dad allowed me to do all the wild projects to keep me busy in West LA as a kid. Randy and I got Schwinn sting bites, stingray bites for Christmas. With those huge handlebars, they were just perfect for holding my paper route bags and treasures that we found. These bikes gave Randy and I wheels to explore West LA and the industrial parks and adjacent neighborhood alleys. As a young kid, I got a head start in life, of work that is, and found lawns to mow and fertilize, making good money as a 11, 12, and 13 year old entrepreneur. I advertised with flyers printed from a refurbished mimeograph I had found dumpster diving down an alley. Thanks dad for helping me keep my equipment in top-notch operating shape, along with my great uncle Bob, so I could learn the work ethic. Just a block from our home was the under construction Santa Monica Freeway. Let me tell you, this is a fascinating kid's adventure. The heavy duty equipment, tractors and pile drivers, the subterranean drainage tunnels, 
and storm drains under bearings that you could drive a car through. We went to their ends where they met up with the main systems. And Dad's dump truck was just down the street in the back alley from us on Jack O'Brien's lot. So we got to see him all the time working on it. Now, going to Richland Avenue Elementary and having the same teacher, Mrs. Parham, as my mom and dad had, really made her ancient by the time I had her. I vividly remember over, the cre over at the creamery on exposition, my dad letting me drive a go-kart he had modified. I'm not sure what happened, but I careened out of the parking lot across the street and T-boned right into his boss, Jack O'Brien's Black Hill Camino. I was okay. But I guess that was the end of my budding racing career. <laughs> Not meant to be. I recall Mom taking us up around the L.A. Temple each Sunday almost to see Grandpa, Grandpa Whitehead's company name, Burgess Whitehead, stamped in the concrete drainage waterways. She would tell us about an early version of a backhoe that Dad would use to dig and put up the retaining walls and concrete fencing around the temple perimeter in his employment with his dad. She taught us the ways of the Lord there. We also went down on Pico to see his work on St. Timothy's Cathedral, one of Grandpa's projects. Scouting, as Randy said, was steeped in Dad's life. Thanks to Grandpa Whitehead's long, uh, lifelong service to it. And so was I, along with Randy. We went on many scouting campouts uh, near L.A. Dad supported all that we did and made countless memories. We even took a week-long trek up to the very top of Mount Whitney. Not many kids can, can claim that. Scouting taught us important skills in life and becoming responsible patriotic citizens in our exceptional country. Now, the 60s were in full regalia at this time while Dad was go-kart racing. Society was changing. The Beatles and Beach Boys ushered in a new rebellious era. Drugs, LSD, marijuana, and our neighborhood fell prey to those addictive, debilitating uses. Liquor stores, uh, anchored about every corner in West L.A. Many in our school became zombies and permanently fried their brains. How we escaped all this as a family is truly a miracle. Thanks to Dad for helping us understand how dangerous drinking was, given his own grandpa's predisposition to alcohol addiction, and how we didn't want to trigger that gene in our own DNA. Dad's countrywide uh, go-kart racing provided wonderful opportunities, and Dad and Mom moved us, as you've heard in our teenage years, uh, to a foreign land, Mansfield in middle Ohio. We went through school a little bit more traditionally there than those progressive fad eras that we went through in L.A. Mrs. Taylor taught me a bookkeeping and accounting class, and I knew then that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Ohio helped me gel early on my interests. It ser would serve me well in my chosen career. Dad, we are grateful to you. You got us out of L.A. so we could be brought up more easily in the ways of the Lord. Isn't that true, Randy and Diane? Dad and racing buddy Mick Rupp took us to the Indy 500 in 1969, flying there on his Corsair and watching an exhilarating race. And as you've heard, Dad had an interesting job as the head of prototype at Rub Manufacturing. We had the latest and greatest mini bikes and snowmobiles. They were fun days. Dad worked on creating a one-of-a-kind Rub snowmobile dragster that MPC models eventually made a 120 scale out of and was sold in the stores. That was cool. There was never a dull moment in our Ohio school years. In Ohio, we got to know Ed Promosic. A dear friend who now lives close by in Salt Lake. I earned my Eagle Scout while there. Mick Rupp remained a cherished, long life friend. And our friendship with the Kecks who relocated from Ohio to here, we've come full circle because Gretchen helped give Dad a lot of his uh, tender caregiving skills. 
Dad supported me going out to BYU in my freshman year, and I got my patriarchal blessing, which gave me my roadmap for life and helped me understand my heritage. I went on my mission in France so I could learn how to serve the Lord throughout my life, and I got to share His gospel in the nethermost parts of this vineyard. Thank you, Dad, for helping me fulfill an honorable mission. Mitch sold the company, and Dad moved to Utah to work for his brother, Dwayne Brown Chevrolet, Dwayne Brown Chevrolet as its service manager. I resumed my BYU studies as a Utah resident now, and commuted until I graduated in accounting. Having our family relocated from our LA days all together in Utah was a grand experience. Aunt Margie and her kids had moved to Salt Lake, and so did my Aunt Christy. Joni and Dwayne had come from Mesa, and it seemed like a heaven-made place with all his cousins living uh, close by. I got a job, too, at the dealership, computerizing and administering the warranty claims. The service department at the dealership was a great experience for Dad, and he earned travel awards all over the world, and as you've heard, including to Greece, to see with Mom her extended Greek family. We're a quarter Greek. And first cousin she never knew except through pen pal correspondence. I watched Dad to make hard moral decisions at that dealership and to stand up for honesty and principles even if no one would ever find out. I remember when Dad was prodded to replace parts under Jippo with, with Jippo GM parts for warranty claims. But Dad stood up with, for what was right and urged his brother-in-law to not do it. Dad and Grandpa's example of honesty, as Randy has said, even while under duress, has been an example to me my whole life. And that quality is hardly witnessed in today's world, in work settings that are fraught with, routinely re and replete with, deception and justification. Dad's strength of character was witnessed when he decided to quit smoking. He had a bet with John Hughes, his frontline alignment, his front and alignment mechanic, who would be the first to smoke again. Well, we know Dad won. What an agonizing thing to vi virtually quit cold turkey after habitually smoking a pack of Winston's each day for 25 years. I've always admired him for overcoming that. I watched him do it. Eventually, Dad decided to go back in business for himself with a dump truck and a backhoe, and Mom and Dad decided to move from Mill Creek and literally build their own home in Sandy. God, oh, we were so excited. After Ruth and I got married, Dad and Mom were building on Danish Road on one of Marky and Charles' lots. It was fun assisting them to build along with Scott. And you've heard those tender moments. He worked tirelessly on that home. Ruth and I got the spark of building, and it was rekindled in me. We found a Cottonwood Heights lot, and Dad helped us build our dream home back in 92. When I was growing up, Dad had always been busy go-kart racing and two jobs providing for our family. So for me and Ruth, actually building our own home with our own hands was invigorating and exciting. Dad, I am indebted to you for that incredible experience of working side by side with my own dad. I used to say anyone with a back a, a back home and a dump truck can do anything. It helped me tr tremendously piece together my midlife 40 year uh, midpoint. Life went on with all of us siblings. We had the same, we had the blessing of being in mom and dad's sandy home more than once a month over all those years and celebrate our posterity and legacy together. Then Lynn got breast cancer. And so did Diane. We became anxious as a family, and everybody took their turn helping going back east. It was long, it was hard three years. The Lord sent us a tough test to endure and not become bitter. Scott and his family courageously endured. We were sad to see Lynn graduate to the other side, and then Grandma White had joined her not long thereafter. Lynn's death changed the way we viewed things and caused us the family to consider more deeply the purpose of life, the challenges of mortality, 
and the essence of the atonement of Jesus Christ and eternal life and our covenants that we make here. This is a place of learning and transition. The Lord was teaching our families, hearts, and souls the things of eternity, as hard as they were on our close-knit family. As a young kid, Mom would have daily morning prayers with us, as Randy said. And in all those prayers for years was that our dad would someday become active back in the church. This is a tender subject for me. My older brother-in-law, Alan, through Tom Holman, got our family involved with the Nauvoo Temple Baptistry Project of John the Baptist Baptizing Christ, that stained glass project. And our family did a project for the Palmyra Visitor Center. It was wonderful goal to go back with Dad and Alan and replace out a piece of stained glass in the dome of the Temple Celestial Room just before its dedication. Dad and Mom's good friends and neighbors, Dion and Marianne Graybill, were stellar influences to them. And as you heard, Mom and Dad were called on a mission out of the clear blue. We were so excited, but Dad wasn't so sure. He was inactive. But we went on this family trip, as you've heard, to see what it might be like. We made our way back to Adam on Diamond, where we were called to serve. Now, here's my take on this. Only the director wasn't quite so kind to us. It was a letdown, and we came home solemn and taken aback. It took over a year to regroup. And I remember talking to Randy, and he didn't share the story, so I get to share it. He was counseled by, I think, Elder Peterson, that mom and dad would end up going on their mission. He said we needed to have faith, and that it was the Lord that called them, not that director. I said to Randy, well, Randy, we better go get mom and dad a blessing. I caught myself, and I says, oh, wait, you think dad will let us? Well, we said a quick prayer, courageously went over to mom and dad's house, and they let us give them a blessing, our first blessing ever to our dad in his mid-60s by Randy and me. Now, you know there's more to this story, but this was a poignant turning point because Randy and I had the faith that we acted immediately on a prompting from the Spirit. And the fruits of urging that, that urging were sweet and sublime. And a testimony how the Lord cares and works in mysterious ways to take care of our family. Mom and Dad eventually filled a, fulfilled a fulfilling mission. We drove them out, many visited them there. It was so sweet. They served with all their hearts, achieved much, and in the process, garnered many lifelong friends. We went to Mantua as a family where his mom, Lily, grew up and did work in an upstairs temple ordinance room. Going back to our ancestral home where our pioneer forebears settled, escaping from the persecutions of Europe and the Old World, Denmark and Switzerland, were pointed for us. It sanctified our family that day, and we felt the spirit that we've never forgotten that day. And you know, Mom and Dad eventually downsized and built their home in Lehigh. It was meant to be because Diane and Ellen got to move next door, and the rest is history. We have enjoyed watching our families grow, visit frequently, celebrating life's events together, and being there for each other. That is what life is all about, and that's what Dad taught us. We are grateful for their gracious Lehigh war. And then it happened. Mom had a stroke, and 10 years later, she was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer again. It was our turn to rally once more, and we built her casket out of oak with accented walnuts, walnut layers. And months later, she got to go be reunited with Lynn and her loved ones. Dad, now it's time to thank you. You're not there, you're here, up here sitting right there. You have an awesome posterity, and we have, we have the best dad. As the families work together on your walnut casket with love for the last few months, Randy and I have shared a lot together. Also with Diane and Alan, along with everybody who has lovingly provided caregiving, while cherishing bonding moments as his health wane. 
We made a lifetime of family memories. I am going to cherish, and we are going to cherish forever. We are so blessed. I love you, Dad. I'm grateful that you're my dad. And what a sublime moment. It must have been the other day as you slipped into the next realm of eternity and were embraced by Mom, by Lynn, your mom and dad and cherished friends and family. I hope to be able to serve out the rest of my life in an honorable and righteous manner like you, faithful to the end. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the messages which have been shared. We appreciate uh, the time and effort that's been put into this, and we all feel the love that, uh, that Jim has given to each of us. Um, after my brief remarks, we will have a closing hymn, because I haven't given much on page 219. Our closing prayer will be given by Christy, or Sister Christy Lambert. After the closing prayer, we will have pallbearers um, come grab the casket under the direction of the, the funeral director, and um, and then we'll stand and, and as they move Jim out. Um, I think I speak for everybody outside of the family here um, in many ways that we've all been ministered by Jim in, in one way or another. Um, Jim Jim had uh, stood out to me in, in many ways of of being somebody who lets go of the world and puts the will of the Lord first. Uh, every time I'd go visit Jim, I'd be welcomed with a, how's it going, pal? Um, and then we'd talk truck modifications, and then we'd go over the NASCAR rules about every single time, because I couldn't get it. Um, and then um, we started watching NASCAR at times, and I really enjoy it. Uh, so, but he is one person that I know stood out, what stood out to me is most is how he let God prevail and how he put the will of the Lord first in his life. Never complained. This was a man that struggled to get to church, but always was early to church. He was here during winter storms. He was here during nice hot days. And he would be handing out programs to everybody in the ward, greeting them with a smile. How's it going, pal? My kids really look up to Jim just because of that, and the opportunity to be able to meet a man who is, a, who is somebody who is like God. We have a choice here. We have a choice to let the Lord prevail in our life. And I think the reason why Jim, one of the reasons why Jim let him prevail in his own life is because he understood what the Savior's role and mission was here on this earth. Found in Doctrine and Covenants section 76, it says that he came into this world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world, and to bear the sins of the world, and to be sanctified of the world, and to be cleansed from it, all righteousness, that through him, we might be saved. And Jim knew that. Jim knows that we have a choice here and that we have the assurance that we can return to live with our Father in Heaven again. And that was his desire. And he ministered to each and every one of us to feel that. And we felt that as we each ministered or went to him to be ministered by him. We look up to Jim and his example to us. We're grateful for the messages that were shared by the family and for their welcoming invitations for us to be part of this family. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to have been gathered here today to celebrate James Blake Whitehead. We all love you, Jim, and we all miss you already so very much. But we are so grateful for the rejoicing that has taken place with Pauline and Lynn and Mom and Dad. So many others that our family and friends, that we can't really be so sad. We can only be happy. We are thankful for every word that has been spoken today, for us to come closer to you, to understand what a, a wonderful person, a vibrant person, yet a gentle person that you are. We're thankful for your examples of love. We're thankful for your love of your family, for those that you come in contact with, that always you always make us all feel so special. We're grateful for your example of integrity and honesty, of service that you have given to us, especially as you gave so much service to Pauline in her later years. We're thankful for your love of Jesus Christ and how important that was to you and to us. We're thankful to understand also your ability to never complain, but to keep smiling and to be happy and to be concerned about everybody that walked through your door and those that were distant, distantly living. We absolutely adore you and appreciate your life. And thank you for touching our lives because in these moments when we miss you, we will be able to reflect back on you and your overwhelming goodness and kindness. So we thank you for being able to recall you and your life and to help us be just a little bit better each day. We know because of you that we will keep smiling. Bless those, especially in the family, give them peace and comfort, not only this day, but always. And we say this in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We invite the Paul Bears, Jim Whitehead, Alan Knight, RJ Whitehead, Jason Kest. Casteller, Randy Whitehead, Scott Casteller, Brady Knight, and Brett, Brett Casteller to come forth. We also invite the audience to rise at this time. 